it really does give me great pleasure to introduce Graham Hickman tonight. Uh, Graham's one of our founder members who was stuck down in a dusty basement underneath uh, Dudley Museum, saving the world, uh, right at the very start of our society back in 75. So it's with great pleasure I introduce Graham tonight. And Graham's going to give us, um, from his wealth of experience, uh, formerly with BP Exploration, a little bit about the time he spent in paradise doing geology. So without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Graham. Okay. Take it away. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. And um, thank you for the opportunity to um, give, you a, give you a talk this evening. So I hope, um, as the title suggests, uh, this will warm us up on a, on a cold, um, cold January evening. So this is, um, this is the southeastern coast of Trinidad and um, Galliote Point of the distance, which I'll, I'll come on to in a bit. Um, so five points of my talk and the map of the Caribbean. So here's the, the Caribbean bathymetry, uh, the Venezuela, South American coastline, and Trinidad sits down here with the uh, red circle around it. So everybody can see that. And so Trinidad is the southernmost island in the Lesser Antilles. So the Lesser Antilles are this uh, chain of volcanic islands, uh, Montserrat, Dominica, uh, St. Lucia, Grenada, Tobago. And it, it, it oops, what happened here? It, um, Trinidad is, the, is the, like I say, the southernmost island, but it's uh, not really more akin to the geology of, of South America. And uh, it's very tropical. It sits 10 degrees north of the equator, uh, 61 degrees west. So there's about five hour time difference with the UK. And uh, it ranges between 26 to 30 degrees Celsius all year round, day or night. And it's very hot and humid. Um, this was a little tree frog that I woke up one day, opened the curtains and it was stuck on the window. Gives you an idea of the sort of uh, habitat and the climate. And this is a view across one of the valleys in the uh, the northern range with a with a coconut palm, the mist in the in the background, and the uh, uh, very heavy tree foliage. It um, was discovered by Christopher Columbus on his third voyage. So his first two voyages, um, he discovered Hispaniola, and uh, it was on his third voyage in 1498. Um, he set sail from Cape Verde Islands and he arrived in uh, the coast of Trinidad on the 31st of July in 1498. And he named the island Trinidad because of the uh, three peaks that he could see from the, um, from the ocean and uh, also uh, after the, the Trinity. And he spent about two weeks uh, sailing around down here in the Gulf of Parier and off to Margarita along the Venezuelan coast. Um, he recognized that the, he'd, he'd reached a big continent because the Orinoco River, the Orinoco Delta, um, meets the Atlantic Ocean just south of Trinidad. And a large amount of fresh water comes off the Orinoco Delta. It's the, uh, it has the third largest catchment area of the rivers in, um, in South America. So the Amazon being the first, and the uh, Piranha, uh, La Plata, La Plata River in uh, Argentina being the second, and the Orinoco being the third. Large amount of sediment, large amount of water uh, comes into the ocean. It's very uh, makes the ocean very green, and uh, creates quite strong currents. So uh, Christopher Columbus would have would have noticed this. He explored the southern coast here. Um, landed on Trinidad, and uh, he was so impressed with the the climate, um, the vegetation, uh, the the Amerindians who were were the natives there, that he literally thought he had discovered the spot of the Garden of Eden, and hence he he think he thought he'd arrived in paradise. Well, um, the Amerindians had been there for about five thousand years before. 
uh, Christopher Columbus had arrived, and there was probably um, a land bridge at some point between South America and, and Trinidad. So looking at the history, uh, we've got Christopher Columbus arriving 1498, claiming it for Trinidad, tr sorry, claiming the island uh, for Spain, naming it Trinidad. Um, but it didn't really get underway as a Spanish colony um, until about 1592. And then it was quite hard getting people to go there. And it wasn't until um, sort of 1776 when actually the French arrived. There's a large contingent of French. And uh, then the, the British took over. They took control, control from Spain and uh, made it a crown colony in 18, 1802. And this pretty much stayed uh, part of the British Empire until it became independent in 1962. And uh, there's an interesting story around this um, sort of colonization. Uh, Ralph Abercrombie was the admiral who um, captured Trinidad from the Spanish. He had uh, about 18, 18 sailing ships at his disposal when he did that. And uh, they built a, a fort on the northern side of the island near uh, Las Cuevas, which is one of my favorite beaches. And it's called Fort Abercrombie. And uh, there's nothing there now. There's just an old rusty cannon. But uh, it was built in, um, I think it was built in 1804 or something like that, um, and destroyed in 1805. And the reason it was destroyed was because the commander um, in charge of the fort saw British ships going off to fight the, uh, um, the Trafalgar, and he thought it was the Spanish. So he um, spiked his cannons and burnt the fort. And obviously after Trafalgar, uh, there was no need to, to rebuild it. So going back to the geology, uh, looking now at the plate tectonic boundaries in the Caribbean Sea, uh, the, I've clearly labeled here the, the boundaries. There are the two colors here. The green ones are convergent plate boundaries. So this, in this case, this is where two um, oceanic plates are colliding and the uh, the older and colder Atlantic plate is being subducted below the Caribbean plate and as it melts um, it forms this line of volcanoes which is the, the Lesser Antilles. The other plate boundaries are, are in orange and these are these are transformed plate boundaries so this is where the plates be it uh, oceanic or continental are sliding past one another, a bit like the, um, the San Francisco Fault. And uh, you'll notice here that Trinidad uh, has one of these orange lines going straight through the middle of it. So um, it has a plate boundary. The geology of the north and the geology of the south are very, very different. Uh, down here on the coast of South America, of course, uh, this is a passive margin. So this is when the Atlantic split away from um, Africa or the South America split away from Africa, um, the uh, Atlantic basically continuous from ocean crust into continental crust as a passive margin down here in, in South America. Now, the movement on the Caribbean plate is quite rapid. It's about two centimeters or 20 millimeters a year in um, a relative sense in, in an east direction. So, Basically, the northern part of Trinidad is moving um, to the east, and the southern part is moving to the west. So if we look at a line uh, across the frontier, just north of Trinidad, through the island of Tobago and uh, Grenada, um, this is what's happening. The, the Atlantic plate being subducted below the Caribbean plate, the melt that's associated going up and forming these uh, volcanoes of the Lesser Antilles. Uh, but what's also interesting is that in front of the, um, the subduction zone here, we have what's called an accretionary wedge. Now, all the sediment coming off the Orinoco River piling up down here on the uh, ocean floor, but the, the fact that this plate is um, moving or the colliding of these two plates is causing a lot of folding and deformation of the sediment sitting in front of it on the seafloor. And uh, there are some deep water seismic lines that have been shot around this area looking for 
uh, hydrocarbon potential. And these show up really well, these um, sort of low angle folded and thrust belt uh, in front of the uh, convergent margin. So this is a map of Trinidad. Uh, this was made in the 1960s by a, um, a fellow called Hans Krugler. He was a Swiss uh, geologist who um, was born in about 1896 or something like that. And he went to Trinidad, I think first in about 1916, but then again in the 1920s and stayed there until about 19, um, 1959, I think. And uh, he was very, uh, very involved in oil exploration, both in Trinidad and in Venezuela. And uh, people have actually called him the father of Trinidadian geology. And this is quite a remarkable map. Um, uh, the detail and the accuracy uh, still holds up today. And anybody who's done geology in a tropical climate will know how difficult that is because all of the, the weathering is really deep. Um, the rocks are all red and it's very, very difficult to, um, uh, to, to distinguish things and to map things. Uh, so you have to take your hat off to this guy. He did a, he did a fantastic job. Um, so these two big uh, orange lines are where the plate boundary um, sort of passes through the geology at the surface in Trinidad. Uh, this northern El Pillar fault separates the northern range, which is a, a mixture of sort of low-grade metamorphic rocks of Jurassic and Cretaceous age, uh, with the Coroni Basin, which is a, um, a Pleistocene pull-apart basin with a lot of uh, extensional regime. And then south of the central zone fault zone, uh, central range fault zone is the southern basin. And this is predominantly a thrust and fold belt, similar to the line that I showed you offshore. Um, so if we look at a um, if we look at a seismic line or sort of look at a, a cross section through this area down here, um, you'll see a number of uh, thrusts and folds that have been um, created by the uh, compression of the, of the converging plate margin. So this is akin to the accretionary prism that we see offshore. Now, if we look at earthquakes, uh, this is a distribution of earthquakes over a six year period uh, from 1990 to 1960, but it's fairly representative of any, any longer period of um, time in this area. What you see here, uh, the, the earthquake epicenters have been shaded by their depth. So the red ones are the shallow ones down to 33 kilometers. The orange are between 33 and 70 and the green are deeper, uh, 70 to 300 kilometers. And what you see with the, the way the colors are, uh, are trending is that the deeper ones are all on the Western side. So this is reflecting earthquakes originating from um, the, the sinking Atlantic plate below the Caribbean. And so from the earthquake epicenters, you can sort of map out how the is, is diving at depth. Um, so this is a little map around Trinidad, and you can see the cluster of Trinidads here. These were the earthquakes that I experienced in the, in the time that I was there. And uh, in particular, this one here, I've highlighted in orange. Um, this one was a magnitude six. It was about 50 kilometers from Trinidad and um, at a depth of 63 kilometers. And uh, it, it probably, well, it felt like it went on for minutes, but uh, I suspect in reality, it was probably less than a minute. Um, but to be woken up by an earthquake of that magnitude at uh, two o'clock in the morning was quite a frightening experience. And uh, it was certainly one that I'll never forget. Um, I probably didn't go to sleep for, for about a week because uh, there were so many sort of aftershocks associated with it. And you didn't know whether the aftershock was going to be another big one or not. Um, you know, fortunately, and um, you know, nobody was hurt. But um, the the following year, there was probably an earthquake. You know, every week it was um, it was quite an unsettling experience. Um, but people who live in Trinidad, um, you know, this is day to day thing. They they just get on with it and. Uh, I guess it's one of the uh, the downsides of living in paradise. So now I'm going to move on to the Columbus Basin. So this was the uh, the area I worked on when I was there. 
And uh, the Columbus Basin is an offshore uh, sedimentary basin to the southeast of Trinidad, and it sort of has this triangular shape. Now, what you can see straight away is there's a lot, uh, quite a large number of linear faults, um, mostly with the down throw to the northeast. And this is described as a gravitational collapse basin. So you can see it sits sort of proximal to the front of the Orinoco Delta. So um, the geology is very strongly related to the sediments that have come out of the Orinoco Delta in the past. Um, the white line there is fairly hard to see, but um, this is a seismic line now uh, through the Columbus Basin. And it's been colored in various colors depending on the, the age of the stratigraphic units. All of these sediments are Pliocene and Pleistocene in age. So um, there's about five or six kilometers of sediment that's four million years old. The massive uh, depositional rate, it, it equates to something like five or six uh, meters per thousand years. This is an aggradational system uh, coming out from the, uh, the mouth of the Orinoco Delta. Um, you can see by this gray uh, area here, this is the uh, seabed uh, sort of dipping away very quickly to the northeast. And uh, what's happening here is that the, the sediments are, are being deposited in the um, accommodation space created by these large sort of listric faults, these large extensional faults, as they slide on a detachment area, uh, a depth over what they believe is a, a Cretaceous, um, Cretaceous sediments. So the accommodation space is provided by the, the, the structural um, extension and most of the sediment is dumped on the edge of the shelf and this is referred to as a sort of shelf edge delta. Uh, I'm going to skip that one and go on to this one. So these these rocks can be seen really well on the southeastern coast of Trinidad. On the field trips we went on to look at them and you can see these large prograding sequences of interbedded sand and shale. And uh, these were a really good study area for looking at, uh, for analogs for some of the reservoirs that we saw offshore. And you could sort of measure the extent of the sand and the thickness of the interbedded shales and things like that. And um, the fact that these were interbedded high quality uh, sands and shales provided a really good system for trapping hydrocarbons offshore. So moving on to this map, this is a map of the um, oil and gas fields in Trinidad. So the gas fields are shown here in red, the oil fields in green. Um, so Trinidad has a very long history of oil exploration. In fact, some of the first oil well in the world were um, in the 1850s. And exploration uh, predominantly was, was onshore uh, until the 1960s when it moved offshore. And uh, Hans Kruger's map was basically mapping a lot of these anticlines, a lot of the fault systems in these onshore areas. And uh, the, the onshore predominantly oil, um, the Cretaceous is much nearer the surface and is, uh, is mature for oil. As the Cretaceous moves offshore here, it gets too deep. It's probably gone into the gas phase. And uh, we also get a lot of gas from the Pleistocene sediments uh, in the form of biogenic gas from the buried um, organic material that is um, incorporated in with the in with the sediments. So the area I was working is uh, this area down here, the Columbus Basin. And um, back in 2015, the BP had uh, 13 offshore platforms in this area, uh, which the the gas was being piped back onshore and across to uh, a big LNG plant on the other side of the island. And uh, BP had been uh, been in Trinidad for a long time. Some of these licenses um, were actually awarded before independence, so they went back to the 1960s. Um, and BP made up a huge uh, proportion of the, the national uh, production. So this is a, 
an overview of the LNG plant. This is where all the gas went on the other side of the island. Um, it consisted of a number of trains. These are um, sort of owned by the different different companies, different consortia. Uh, but the purpose was the same: was to compress the gas into a liquid uh, by freezing it, so you could get the temperature down to uh, minus 160 degrees Fahrenheit centigrade, rather centigrade and the gas becomes a liquid. Uh, once it's in a liquid, it can be put into a, a tanker. So these are LNG tankers. You may have seen them um, you know, off the Isle of Wight, places like that. These are effectively uh, big thermostats, th thermos flasks that try and keep the, the gas um, in a cold state and keep it in a liquid state. And then when these are uh, taken around the world to a degasification plant, at the other end where the gas can be put back into a liquid and fed into um, into the system. So most of the gas from Trinidad goes to um, Brazil and South America. Uh, next lot goes to the, the Caribbean and, and the US. Uh, there is some that comes to the UK and then there's a small amount that goes to the Middle East and uh, the Far East. And uh, interestingly enough we have three um, LNG terminals in the UK. Uh, so we have one in Kent and uh, two, um, where, I can't remember where they are, but uh, on the south coast somewhere. So these are where LNG tankers can bring liquefied gas into the UK um, system. So now I'm going to move on to the sort of the exploration and appraisal. And um, this was the office where I worked. This is uh, Queen's Park Plaza in Trinidad. Uh, this used to be a hotel built in the 1930s in an art deco form. And uh, these were some of the people that I worked with, the uh, seismic delivery team that uh, whose main job was to work on uh, seismic acquisition and processing. And then a, a predominantly geology and geophysics team working on the uh, seismic data interpretation. Um, so these are some images I pulled off a, a BP um, uh, in, in, on the internet. And uh, what this basically shows is the area of the survey. This was a 1,000 square kilometer survey. It took two years to shoot. And uh, the in red were the, or, the, the gas fields that we were interested in looking for um, additional opportunities be they sort of infill drilling or exploration prospects. And uh, what we managed to do was generate a number of options, um, several of which then got drilled. And one field in particular, this Angelin field, is the one that I want to talk about in a bit more detail. But first of all, I'll talk about the, uh, the seismic survey. So this was a special type of seismic survey. It was called an OBC or an ocean bottom cable seismic survey and um, normally uh, you have a vessel with receivers uh, towed behind on a on a cable and an air gun creating a source at the back of the boat so you get a very linear survey in this particular case these the cables were laid on the sea floor and a stationary recording vessel um, sort of gathered the signal from the from these cables and the source vessel uh, went back and forth across these cables in a, um, a sort of checkerboard fashion. So this created a, uh, a much better improvement in the signal in that we were actually um, coupled to the seabed. And uh, so you see these two people trying to listen to the conversation going on next door. And uh, the person with their head to the, their head to the wall has got the coupling and we'll hear what's going on much better. Uh, um, the other benefits of the survey were that um, the density of the data uh, improved, improved the resolution and the positioning. So when you're looking at uh, details in the subsurface, such as uh, the position of a fault or the position of a, um, a gas contact, uh, it was very important to get this as, as accurate as you could um, for when you went to drill it. And so this is an example of the data that was uh, available prior 
and the, date, the data uh, after we'd shot this survey. And um, some of these flat events down here relate to contacts between the gas and the water. And these more vertical lines here are the fault planes. So similar to this sort of trap on the side of a fault here. And what we were able to do was better define both the traps, the reservoirs and the contacts. And this allowed us to both calculate the resources available and position uh, wells to target them. So now I'm going to move on to the, the Angelin gas field. So um, the Angelin gas field is located in that northern area, about 60 kilometers um, to the east of Trinidad, in water depth of about 65 meters. And it's, I guess what it's called is, is a sort of stranded discovery. So it was drilled originally in, um, in 1995, which is quite a long time ago, uh, with a well called El Diablo. And uh, the results merited a second well, um, again, which was uh, drilled, you know, another decade later, La Novia. Um, and what they recognized was that there was a number of segments uh, and it was sort of compartmentalized field and it was very difficult to uh, commercialize the, um, the gas in that because it's, because it's compartmentalized, you need to dedicate sort of an individual well to each of these pools in order to uh, extract the gas. Um, the other problem with it was that there was a lot of gas seeping naturally to the surface, and this was distorting the seismic image. Um, so when you, when you mapped the, um, this was the sort of picture you got. Um, it, it wasn't clear to you that you had sufficient volume in the crest um, to warrant uh, commercializing and, and developing this, uh, this field. But with the new data, we were able to map uh, the crest, map the reservoirs uh, much better. And the, the case that we came up with uh, looked like this. So it, it more, than, um, more than doubled the volume. And uh, what, was, what was even better was that the, the better quality reservoirs uh, were actually located in the crest of the field. So um, this made a whole difference to the view of, um, of this field having acquired this seismic data. And uh, the consequence of that was that the, um, the field went forward uh, to sanction. So uh, this was a, a press announcement on the 2nd of June in 2017, Angelin project gets, gets the green light. So this basically meant that it moved um, from the sort of exploration appraisal phase um, at the same time, several of the other um, prospects that we'd identified down here uh, moved forward and were drilled. And again, here's another uh, press release with uh, discoveries of two, two more gas discoveries. And uh, recently, at the end of last year, there was, a, there was a, another one for a, for a third discovery down here. Um, so this then moved on to a, a process of uh, sort of design and fabrication. So there was um, a big project set up to design and build a facility to um, develop these gas reserves. There was commercial negotiations with the government to extend the gas contract and then the fabrication. So in the yard in Mexico, um, this huge platform uh, was being built and you see little people for scale. And um, once the platform and the, um, the what, what they call the, the top sides and the jacket, the jacket being the, the legs, uh, was completed in Mexico, it was uh, fabricated at a yard in Mexico, it was shipped to Trinidad on this, on this enormous barge. Um, this big boat here, the, uh, this, this, is, this is like a, a sort of an offshore uh, crane, big lifting facility, and there were about 200 people uh, on this vessel to help the installation. So the the legs of the platform were put into the into the water and pile driven into the seabed, 
and then the um, the top sides were lifted off the the barge and uh, bolted onto the legs of the platform. Um, the next thing, of course, was to drill the wells. And so here you can see the um, the platform here has been installed. This is a jackup rig. Um, this is the Rowan Explorer Two rig. You can see these three big legs that are used to um, jack up the the rig so it can work in various water depths and over the platform then a drilling rig is put and the wells are actually drilled through the platform such that the finished well can then be tied into the um, production facilities and i should say actually that at the same time as all this was going on a pipeline uh, vessel was laying a pipeline to the other facilities to tie into the, uh, the pipeline network. So this was all completed um, in February uh, 2019, and um, so they've had gas uh, coming out now for um, for over a year. Uh, finally, I'm going to move on to the uh, the geological highlights of my adventures. So it wasn't all work; I did get to do a little bit of play and a little few adventures around the around the island. Um, so one of the places I went to where you saw a lot of the uh, the wildlife photographs at the beginning was uh, Asa Wright uh, Nature Reserve in the Northern Range. And uh, this is up in the mountains and uh, you can see the deep lateritic uh, weathering um, below the um, below the soil line. You can see very, very thin soil this um, sort of uh, continuous sort of orangey color, rusty red color of the, um, uh, the sort of subsoil and rocks. And it's actually very difficult doing field work there to, to sort of identify what you're looking at because things are so weathered. And uh, the weathering in the a tropical environment goes down very deeply. So, you know, here's a picture of my wife next to it for scale. You can see this is, um, you know, this is probably a good uh, five meters tall. Um, one of the other things that was very popular were water, waterfall hikes and um, the Avocart waterfall, again, in the middle of the Northern Range here, um, is one of these features that has been produced because of this uh, recent tectonic uplift. So you can see that the, um, the river systems are quite juvenile, they're very young rivers, very young profiles, and they have these massive uh, waterfalls associated with them. And uh, because the jungle, uh, nobody really owns it or looks after it, uh, the footpaths are very difficult to, to manage. So most people um, use the streams as footpaths. And I think this was probably one of the most off-putting things I found was when I went on my first hike um, with one of the groups there, the first thing everybody did was jump in the water. Well, I was there with my leather UK walking boots, and I thought, I'm not going in that water. And they all said, well, if you don't, you won't get there. So um, eventually I had to disband my boots and buy a pair of water shoes, uh, which have holes in. The water goes in and comes out again, and your socks are dry within 20 minutes. Um, and so that's the way you do it. You jump in the water, and you, you go up these streams, and you sail off them if you've got some ropes, and uh, just have a lot of fun. And so this is my wife again on one of our hikes up to her chest in water. And what's sort of amazing is that because it's so warm, um, you dry off really quickly. So we were out there once in a thunderstorm and we got absolutely soaked, soaked to the skin. But within 20 minutes, we were dry. We didn't really feel the cold at all. Um, another fascinating uh, waterfall again in the Northern Range was this uh, Tura Cascades. And this is... Uh, a, a carbonate, calcium carbonate rich uh, deposit that um, comes out of one of these springs and forms a series of pools or dams uh, across the stream. And uh, there's probably about five or six of these of varying heights. So this one here you can see is about uh, two meters in, in height. It probably formed originally by a, by a log um, across the river, but has built up uh, since and it um, it forms a cascade over over the top of the pools. 
Um, this is another one here. Uh, this is considerably bigger. Um, I don't know what you, what he estimated that probably six meters high. And so these are uh, spectacular features. And uh, I must admit, I've never seen anything like these on my on my travels. Um, interesting uh, cave we went to was the Gaspari Cave, and this was um, uh, a limestone cave in uh, Cretaceous limestone um, offshore um, Trinidad. And uh, the nice thing about this cave is that there was a big collapse in the roof, so uh, there was this natural light coming into into the cave. And um, the water here, uh, through a series of um, uh, fractures, was actually connected to the ocean. And so it rose and fell with the tides. It was salt water, beautiful and clear, and uh, they allowed us to swim in it. So it was one of the, uh, um, again, a really, really nice experience to be able to swim in, in a cave in crystal clear uh, salt water. It gives you great buoyancy. Um, so in the south of the area, uh, it's it's much harder to get around. There's fewer roads, as you can see here. The uh, majority of the people live in Port of Spain and um, San Fernando down here on the on the west coast. But there are some interesting geological features to go and look at in um, in the west. And uh, one of them is this is this one called the Devil's uh, Woodyard. And uh, the legend goes that in in 1852 and uh, felled some trees and frightened the local Amerindian villagers. And they believed that the, uh, the devil had come from beneath the earth and felled the woods. And what it is, it's a mud volcano. So in the sort of thrust belt, the fold and thrust belt to the southwest of Trinidad there, southeast of Trinidad, um, when the, uh, uh, the overpressured muds uh, in the subsurface become too great, they break out as a as a volcano, and uh, it's sort of an intermittent event. So this this picture here is an aerial photograph in in 2018. Um, when I was there in uh, 2015, it wasn't as dramatic, and so I had to uh, had to poke the devil to see if I could get him to come out, and I just got some some small bubbles. But um, again, these are there's a whole load of these, probably ten of them. Uh, across the southern part of, of Trinidad. Um, and then finally, the uh, La Brea um, Pitch Lake is uh, another feature that I found quite, quite fascinating. This is uh, in the southwestern part of Trinidad. It's a breached oil field and um, it's been exploited for, for bitumen. Uh, for, for quite a long time. And it has this, if you look at these, these little circular patterns on it, it's sort of got a um, uh, sort of a, a slow movement to it. So it's quite, it's quite deep. The, um, uh, the, the pitch warms up, moves up and, uh, and, and moves down in between these, these little circular patches, um, you actually get rain accumulating. So you get this sort of uh, network of uh, grass and rivers and things growing on top of it. And this is, uh, uh, this is one of the guides sort of demonstrating the, uh, uh, the ability to pull the pitch out and, uh, and to wave it around. And uh, Sir Walter Raleigh is uh, reputed to have uh, caught his boats with the uh, pitch from the pitch lake. So hopefully I've uh, entertained you, kept you warm on this um, uh, cold January uh, evening and uh, given you a taste for uh, geology in paradise. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that, Graham. A wonderful tour of a place we don't get to. <laughs> But uh, lovely to see the diversity of features and uh, an area that probably none of us knew at all until tonight.